you're in for a, a great treat uh, this afternoon with uh, Dr. Alexa Alice Jubin, Jubin uh, who will share some of her insights about our good friend, Bill Shakespeare and East Asia. Uh, but before that, I need to put in a little plug for the sponsor. The San Diego Shakespeare Society is a membership organization. Our motto is we do Shakespeare all year round. In addition to occasional lectures such as this, we have two open readings a month. We have a student festival coming up in April. We have a ongoing collaboration with the San Diego Museum of Art. We have stage readings, movie showings, sauna performances, and we even have this guy who puts on mock trials of Shakespearean villains uh, using courtroom procedure and the rules of evidence. So uh, imagine that. So it's quite a gamut. Uh, so please check out our website and consider joining us. Now today, we are so honored to have Alexa, Alexa with us. She's a professor of English, theater, international affairs, women's gender and sexuality studies, and East Asian languages and culture at George Washington University. And she is also the founding co-director of the Digital Humanities Institute at GW. And that's, that's just the beginning. She's into a, a lot of things. And I first became familiar with her work when I watched the online launch of her recently published book, Shakespeare and East Asia. And last fall, when I was arranging the lecture schedule for 2022, I thought uh, I, I'd make a cold call, a cold email uh, uh, to her uh, out of the blue, not imagining or certainly imagining that she'd want to connect with a bunch of rude mechanicals uh, out here in the desert. But I was delighted that she was a uh, uh, gladly accepted uh, and introducing her. I, one thing I want to emphasize, I know that one of her aims is to denationalize Shakespeare and to resituate the works in the widest possible context. And I, I dig that. Uh, I, I, that's really also essentially a goal of the San Diego Shakespeare Society as we seek to promote uh, inclusivity and diversity in it by our programming. Uh, two procedural matters before we start. Alexa will entertain questions at the end of her formal talk, but I ask that you put any questions in the chat feature and I will read them off. Uh, that was many Zoom lectures, that, that seems to be the evolving best practice uh, to handle things efficiently. And second, I ask the audience if you, uh, uh, if you would turn off your video uh, feed by just clicking on that little tab uh, at the bottom. Uh, it's my understanding, perhaps mistaken, uh, that that conserves bandwidth, whatever that is. Uh, so with that, I will turn it over to Alexa. Thank you. We're going to get started over here. What's in the name? That which we call a rose by an Asian name would smell as sweet or not. While the play Romeo and Juliet is propelled by the generations old dispute between the aristocratic Montague and Capulet, the film Chicken Rice War, as you can see behind me, reduces the feud to the rivalry between the Wong and Chan families in Singapore who own competing chicken rice stalls next to each other. No blood is spilled other than that of poultry. Languages and accents are important markers of racial identities in this multilingual film. So in other words, the feud here is reimagined to be a racially motivated, racially motivated division. Virtue, um, just, like, just like race, gender is also an important factor. Right, in performances, in adaptations. Gender roles take on new meanings when Shakespeare travels the world. An example is Twelfth Night. Viola, disguised as a page boy named Cesario, is pursued by the lovelorn Olivia. When Viola declares that I am the man, she will bet her love a dream. She speaks of with, with double irony as a doubly cross-dressed boy actor on the all-male early modern English stage. For example, Nathan Field, 1587 to 1619. And in the all-female Japanese musical theater known as Takarazuka today, as you can see behind me, Viola also embodies a new form of gender fluidity. In Kimura Shinji's 1999 production, Viola was played by an Otto Kuyaku. 
an actress specializing in presenting sensitive masculinity of idealized male characters. And so these are just uh, a few of the compelling examples that, uh, that you can see from performances of Shakespeare around the world. So my talk today draws on my new book that just came out from Oxford University Press. On the screen here is a promotional code for 30% off. Later on, I'm going to put in the chat the direct link to the book on Amazon and on Oxford University Press for your convenience. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Gordon Gitlund, for inviting me to the San Diego Shakespeare Society. I'm standing virtually in the famous Folger Shakespeare Library here in Washington, DC. What a wonderful opportunity and really wonderful to see all of you. Let me begin by saying that Shakespeare went global even during his lifetime. Elements of world cultures informed Shakespeare's plays and those plays have subsequently been translated and performed in many languages. Characters from the Mediterranean, Catalan, France, Vienna, and Venice play a key role in tragedies, comedies, and even the history plays that, is, that are supposed to focus on the question of English identity. Shakespeare's plays often feature locations outside England, Scotland, and Wales, and characters from the Mediterranean, France, and Vienna, they really uh, can be seen all over the place. The history plays, importantly, they often feature foreign characters, um, even if they deal with questions of lineage, because these foreign characters and accents such as Catherine of Aragon and Henry VIII and diplomatic relations between England and France, all of these topics are accentuated by different accents and the presence of foreigners. As products of an age of exploration, Shakespeare's plays demonstrate influence from a rich treasure trove of modern sources in Latin, Italian, Spanish, and French. In fact, the history of global performance dates back to the late 16th century when Shakespeare's plays began to be performed in continental Europe during his lifetime. European tourists and emissaries to England have also attended Shakespeare's plays. During his lifetime, his plays were brought abroad uh, far beyond Europe. In fact, his Hamlet already, already reached colonial Indonesia um, shortly after his death. Modern actors, in turn, bring their own racial and gender identities such as characters, uh, to such characters as Catherine in Henry V or Aaron in Titus Andronicus. Audiences, too, bring their own worldviews to these performances. So it's in this sense that Shakespeare is truly global. Performances in the context of world cultures enrich Shakespeare's own imagination about the world because globalization is a process that opens up cultures to one another and produces many new worlds within. Since the 19th century, stage and film directors have mounted hundreds of adaptations of Shakespeare drawn on East Asian motifs. And by the late 20th century, Shakespeare had become one of the most frequently performed playwrights in East Asia. My presentation today draws not only on my new book, Shakespeare and East Asia, but also on an archive I created at MIT called MIT Global Shakespeare. There you can see a lot of subtitled performances from all over the world. You're cordially invited to explore this open access archive at globalshakespeare.org. That's plural. There are five fascinating aspects about Asian themed performances. We have the question of gender, right? Speaking of, in, speaking of embodiment, and there's also the uses of Shakespeare for socially reparative purposes. Sometimes they do parody this concept. Um, and third, returning to the issue of gender, there are actually transgender performances as well. So we, we will uh, cover that briefly. Um, number four, 
when East Asian performances dramatize racial relationships, sometimes they rely on accents and the use of different languages, rather than so going far beyond just skin color. Last but not least, we find deep connections among all these performance traditions, among all these different cultures. So in other words, East Asian engagements are not isolated from English language performances. They actually talk to each other. So gender, the first thing we'll notice, of course, right, when Shakespeare's performed in a different language is word choice. Word choices in East Asian language films and productions reveal or conceal how much power a character might have over others. In Akira Kurosawa's film, Throne of Blood, Macbeth and Lady Macbeth, they address each other with formal and informal gender pronouns that betray their unease and desire for control. What stands out in the film is how and when some characters choose informal language. When conversing with each other, Macbeth and Banquo, they refer to each other with first names, deepen their voice, and use informal language and the informal masculine I. And I'm going to um, slow down here uh, to facilitate the recording and the virtual format. And when in private, Macbeth and his wife, Macbeth attempts to create a, an intimate bond with his wife. But Lady Macbeth rejects his attempt and maintains verbal and physical distance. It is notable that when Washizu addresses his wife, he does not use any honorific. He does not address her as Tsuma or Okusan. Those are uh, common Japanese terms you would, you would hear um, between husband and wife. Lady Macbeth, meanwhile, uses very formal singular first person pronoun, watakushi, rather than the informal feminine atashi. So in Japanese, the, the first person pronouns are actually gendered, which is, which is fascinating. And, and this amazing filmmaker is taking advantage of that to signal a lot of the subtle layers that we, we may have lost in English language performances. So uh, here, you can see Lady Macbeth working against Macbeth's uh, attempt to establish some kind of intimate bond, right? And she doesn't say, I reject you. She says that certainly through the pronoun choice. In the Japanese Takarazuka musical that I mentioned in the beginning, Viola as Cesario actually was not the only cross-dressing character. Remember, this is an all-female performance. So gender pronouns here are especially fraught because it's an all-female production and there are many layers of disguise. The Japanese language often elides the subject in addition to making the right choice of employing the familiar or the polite register based on the relation between the speaker and the addressee male and female speakers of Japanese are restricted by gender-specific first-person pronouns available to them. Gendered code switching creates semantic ambiguity and double irony. And this is what happens when uh, you see a play like this in a different tradition. Um, some traditions and some cultures, they actually have more freedom, if we may, to play with gender. Um, even in European languages, you will see this, for example, French, right? The, the first person pronouns are not gendered, but as soon as you speak, um, because of the rule of inflection, everything becomes very gendered because the adjective, for example, uh, related to the subject in the sentence would have the inflected, hence giving away the gender of the speaker. So from here, we're going to move on to the next theme of social reparation. Can Shakespeare come to rescue? Does performing Shakespeare or reading Shakespeare make you a better person? 
That's the question that some directors have faced. Some adaptations offer a corrective to Shakespeare's plays, such as Sherwood Hu's Tibetan film, Prince of the Himalayas, which came out in 2006. You can see Ophelia on the screen here, shot and filmed in Tibet with a Tibetan cast speaking Tibetan. This is such a rare film, it's a gem. The film gives Ophelia a more active role through a remedial view of the dramatic action, whereas Shakespeare's Gertrude account of Ophelia recast her as a mermaid-like fairy tale creature. The Ophelia in Prince of the Himalayas is a goddess of nature, an immortal bride who returns to nature. The film still here shows that the scene pays tribute to pre-Raphaelite painter Sir John Everett Millet's painting, Ophelia. Other works mark the conviction that Shakespeare has any recuperative function in the society, such as the Hong Kong comedy film, One Husband Too Many, directed by Anthony Chan in 1988. While the canonical status of Shakespeare's oeuvre has led to admiration and deference, there have been many witty parodies of the tragedy since the 1980s. The film dramatizes its characters near Quixotic insistence on performing and rehearsing Romeo and Juliet to ameliorate their condition. So this is but one of many, many examples where, um, where productions, they don't just come in and reproduce Shakespeare, right? Retelling the story straight. This one is meta. Right, so the, the Shakespearean play shows up as part of the film, but the film itself is not a retelling of Romeo and Juliet event. Shin, uh, the, the, the male actor, pins all his hope. He's the, he's the founder of a troupe as well. Pins all his hope on bringing Western culture to backwater, to a backwater village in Hong Kong. And he does this by staging his version of Romeo and Juliet with the costumes and a soundtrack borrowed from Franco Zeffirelli's 1968 film. He takes on the role of Romeo, his wife plays Juliet. Let's take a look. And after this, I have a quick poll. Um, to, uh, I would love to hear from you. I'll launch a poll after we watch this in terms of um, themes you have noticed in this short clip. Kai 你比掉血 so their performance was disrupted, as you can see, by the rowdy crowd who um, who don't know anything about Shakespeare. They don't care about culture, really. They're there just for, they, they, they thought Julia perhaps would give them a strip tease. At this point, the mayor intervenes and has his henchmen go upstage to maintain the order. Oh, Romeo, you 
办得啦，办得啦！为什么办得？我办谁？谁敢再吵我扁谁？阿志，是不是你在吵啊？老张，赶紧别再落来！阿哥，别吃干净啊！你进来，拍手，不拍倒腿！哎，不准拍！是阿三，你带我是阿三，这不是你气笑所在啦！刘大笨，你是不给八十个面子！刘大笨。嗯、刘大便是你叫的，你还要一小便呢？好、嗯嗯嗯，不要这样嘛！现在演的是罗密欧与朱丽叶，又不是演《仙桃牌通鲁丸》对四五丸。我，我只是想把。啊The spirit of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet, a very violent play about about gang violence, right? The audiences in the film perhaps understood Romeo and Juliet too well,、um, and Romeo and Juliet they literally become an exiled couple that run off,、uh, run for their life.、Uh, as you can see in front of you is the poll, which is still ongoing. I'm going to share the results soon. Please feel free. To uh to click to to in terms of the the themes that stand out to you the most, and um this is multiple choice so you can click more than one whether uh whether it's the themes of gender or race or perhaps the historical tension right to to reimagine Shakespeare's characters in a modern setting or last but not least parody that I speak of. All right, at this. Juncture, I am going to end the poll and share the result with you. I believe you can see the result in front of you right now.、Um, the majority of people here today with us、um, thought that the theme of parody, parody of Shakespeare, or parody of a well-known film, for example, as you recognize from the soundtrack, is directly、uh, is is taken. From Franco Zeffirelli's very well-known film,、um, and parody in these is a is a very strong element in this adaptation.、Uh, but this one is not alone. There are so many such witty works.、Um, this indicate that Shakespeare is so well known around the world, especially in East Asia, that it has become the subject of of parody. Something has to be.、Uh, Widely known, right? Before parodies have become possible, and、uh, of course, reimagining the characters in modern settings. I will also say that this adaptation does an excellent job in not just reimagining Romeo and Juliet in modern setting, but actually in、um, fusing them with the modern setting here. Right? They literally become they. They are both early modern. They are both Renaissance figures, but also,、uh, but also fugitives in a modern nineteen eighty. Hong Kong. From here, we shall move on to、uh, the next theme, which is transgender performance. In the late 1990s, to help change the image of South Korea abroad, the Korean government began sponsoring the production of films and theater works. Within this context of the demo. Uh, democratization of the country. Several Korean adaptations of Hamlet recast Ophelia as a shaman who serves as a medium to counsel the dead and guide the living. Because female shamans exist outside the Confucian social structure, they have greater agency. Inspired by political feminism and academic feminism, these works brought the position of Korean,、uh, rethought the position of Korean women in the society. Although Ophelia has often been appropriated as a feminist symbol, she is also a site of contestations over gender identities. The 2005 South Korean film *The King and the Clown* depicts. The erotic entanglement among a king and two acrobatic street performers. There is the macho Jan Song who plays male roles, and then there is a trans woman named the Gong Ji. Gong Ji shares personality traits with Hamlet's love interest Ophelia. 
So this is an, a trans-Ophelia figure because both Gomji and Ophelia, their life are largely determined by men around them. The transgender Ophelia character draws on the local culture of flower boys. The term flower boy refers to male identifying singer or actor known for the use of makeup and mannerisms that are considered socially to be feminine. Female fans live vicariously through the, these androgynous actors and characters, and they do so without fear of being stigmatized as being promiscuous. The desire and sexuality of the female fans are complex. The fans may have been lesbian, or they may be desiring ideal heterosexual men who rarely exist in reality. So this is a bit of a reversal for those of you who are familiar, a reversal of the Renaissance situation. We understand that in Renaissance times, in Shakespeare's times, they had boy actors, right? Shakespeare worked with all male troops. And here uh, you have this culture of flower boy or the all female performances in Japan that I spoke of earlier, and they attract a predominantly female uh, audience fan base. So, the courtesan, um, what is so interesting here is I'm going to show you a scene um, and um, a, few, a few images from the film to just to show you who did this transgender Ophelia, what, what she looks like. This is played by, uh, this is Gongji, the, the trans woman in the film, right? Uh, and she's a street performer she wears a mask and here she reveals pulls out the mask to reveal her, her face and uh, she doesn't perform ophelia but if you look at the film as a whole that really is a parallel um, her life to ophelia so this is the scene in the court um our Ophelia figure wins the heart of the king. So the king becomes really come intimate with her, spends a lot of time with her, but a courtesan becomes really jealous. So this courtesan, um, Noxu, storms in on the king and Ophelia in an intimate moment and taunts Ophelia about their real gender. The thing points to voyeuristic desires anchored in anatomy as an index to some truth about gender. Noxu tries to undress Ophelia even in front of the king, creating a great deal of tension. Her dramatic act of gender revelation is perhaps to expose Ophelia as an abject subject with alleged physical deficiencies and thereby dissuade the king from bestowing further favors on Ophelia. Such revelation scenes are a familiar device in transgender movies. This is a device to expose, uh, a device of exposure that subjects trans characters to extra scrutiny. And as you can see in another scene on the screen here, later on, the courtesan with the king uh, in their bedroom presses again. Is it really a man speaking about the Ophelia figure here? Um, so. This is a kind of cinematic shock device. Um, and this kind of device captures the struggles over the body's meanings. When we think about it, um, it's actually uh, profound because when we look at performances on stage or on film, it's always about the actor's bodies. Sometimes they may seem transparent because we don't pay attention to them, but actually whether willing or not, actors always bring their racial gender identities um, to the play. So speaking of race, race and ethnicity are not only visible, but actually audible in the multilingual film that I mentioned before from Singapore. The Singaporean film Chicken Rice War uh, is built around the conceit of a college production of Romeo and Juliet. So again, this is similar to the Hong Kong One Husband Too Many. Um, Romeo and Juliet is a strong thematic focus, but these films are not really a straightforward retellings of Romeo and Juliet. So this Singaporean film uses multilingualism as both a dramatic device and a political metaphor. The elder generation converses in Cantonese, whilst the younger generation speak mostly Singlish or Singaporean English. Fenson and Audrey, in a mix of English and Cantonese, they perform the balcony scene, in which Romeo and Juliet meet after the masked ball. 
And so let me first show you, <laughs> for instance, the, 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 the Romeo's father here, right? He's, he's obviously obsessed with chicken because he makes chicken rice. Um, and what's so interesting is the so-called feud really is about commercial competition. And the, the parents, they oppose the, their children's love story um, because they think that it, they think each each other's children are actually commercial spies. They're here to steal their family secret recipes. And so this is the mother of Juliet, equally uh, nonchalant that they just, um, I think the generational divide is also portrayed as a class issue. They were not as, they're not educated in English, first of all, right? So, so language is such an important marker here. Now, when, Fenton and Audrey performed the balcony scene. Um, their offstage parents were invited to, to the university to, to support their production. They became more and more impatient with their public display of affection. They do not understand the boundary between playmaking and playgoing. It's important to note that Singapore has a propaganda. The propaganda emphasizes commercial cosmopolitanism and transnational histories of the immigration in the service of economic growth. Chicken Rice War critiques the idea that sounding white, speaking standard English, speaking Shakespeare in English, conveys more authority. So this takes us to the final topic today, deep connection. So what kind of deep connections are we seeing between Asian and Anglophone performance cultures? Chicken Rice War parodies Bud Lerman's campy film adaptation of Romeo and Juliet. Film, Lerman's film opens with the com composed this passionate, deliberately old fashioned script reading by a female TV news anchor framed by an antiquated television set, right? This is the famous prologue of Romeo and Juliet, two households, both alike in dignity. Now this is followed by a voice, by the voice of a male announcer in a solemn tone against live action shots and an operatic soundtrack. So let us take a look at Bud Lerman's famous Romeo plus Juliet. As usual, I'm going to launch the poll uh, while we watch. This is Bud Lerman. Two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers take their life, whose misadventured piteous overthrows doth with their death bury their parents' strife. The fearful passage of their death-marked love and the continuance of their parents' rage, which but their children's end naught could remove, is now the two hours traffic of our stage. Feel free to share your responses. As you can see, um, Lerman's now classic and canonical take, right, in, from, from 1999, uh, not only reimagines the characters in a modern setting, but actually they brought in cultural differences as well. Montagues versus the Capulet, one side is portrayed as more Latinx. Right, with Spanish accents and so on. Um, the other is, uh, the other side represents a kind of Catholic whiteness, right? Religion also plays uh, a very important role in this. 
What intrigues me is how this long opening sequence, very often uh, critiqued as MTV-like, repeats that famous prologue three times. First by the female TV announcer, second time by this operatic male um, announcer, uh, typical of trailer of the 1990s, and then also textually, as you can see on the newspaper headlines and so on. So visually, as well as orally, to repeat, repeat and drive home the main messages about hate in the, in the uh, prologue. So here is our poll result. Uh, the largest number of people are struck by the film's reimagination of Shakespeare in modern settings. And of course, gender roles are also an important theme. Um, actually, we have, uh, after the modern setting, I think equal number of people uh, are interested in gender and racial identities uh, here. Um, the parody element, I would think, perhaps if you uh, see this as a very campy film, indeed, I think it could be seen as parodic, but hold your drink. We are about to see real parody. So how does the Singaporean film came out in 2000, right? At that point, uh, DiCaprio and Claire Denise, they, uh, they, from the film, they already became quite a star. And the Singaporean film responded to this iconic take. So a real parody. Scene. Two families, both alike in dignity and profession, in fair Ang Mo Kyo, where we lay our scene. From ancient grudge bred to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. From forth the fatal loins of these two foes, a pair of star-crossed lovers choose their chicken rice. What are you saying? Do you think Mr. Tan and Amokyo can understand you? When I told you not to speak in Singlish, I didn't ask you to sound like Shakespeare. Do it again. Do it again. <laughs> So during rehearsal, our main character, Fenson, he dreams of playing Romeo um, and he's after the, 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 the actress. And I think that's his motivation of wanting to become Romeo, right? And here he's asking the, the drama coach whether he can play Romeo. The problem is um, he stutters. Um, interestingly, the film suggests at one point that reciting Shakespeare cures his stuttering. Me. May I be so bold as to ask for a chance to read Romeo? What makes you think that you can be Romeo? What makes you think you can play Romeo? You don't have the looks and you can't even speak properly. Nick, on the other hand, he looks like Leonardo DiCaprio. That's why he's Romeo. Do you think you look like Leonardo? Yeah, I agree. <laughs> This is my first time in the play, you know? No! Where the hell did you get that tool from anyway? My friend works in a bridal shop. Very expensive. Very ugly. <laughs> Replacing the figure of the priest in Romeo and Juliet is this man standing between the two feuding families. He's a chicken supplier. So he supplies chickens to both families and that's playing an important role. Both families have to respect his authority, not religious authority, but chicken authority. And so he's here to keep peace. Come on. Tonight we're here to see a very high class play. Huh? So we're all dressed very nicely, very high class. Huh? Tonight, let's keep all the business at the Hawker Center, okay? 
Maybe it's a good idea that the two families sit separately. Ah, want to lay toilet pin? Ah, sang lay toilet pin. No, I don't want to keep the peace. Ah, thank. Lips that they must use in prayer. Ah, look, the poor guy. Ah, with our Audrey talking, ah, very big time. I know Audrey is being Juliet. I must see you act with this safe for some. But then they're saint. Let lips do what hands do. They pray. Grandalless. from my lips, by dying. My sin is purged. Then have my lips the sin that they have told. 又瘦又丑样，癞蛤蟆想食天鹅。唔知咩新鲜萝卜皮都唔。Sin from my lips. Trespass with the urge. Give me my sin again. 哈！你睇个啲后果啊！你睇佢勾引我个仔啊！你睇下，你想我唔系咁做，咁我仔啊攞咗我啲。What's your stupid recipe? 又加埋鸡饭，你又埋鸡饭，连放炸关你咩事啊？吓，你识卖鸡饭？你识咩鸡饭？In the end, the parents unfortunately takes over their show, right? Romeo and Juliet on stage simply cannot compete with the dramatic parents who are staging their own show off stage. Here is the result of our poll. And as you can see, uh, the racial identities come, come up to the fore, especially in the reference to Nick's Eurasian features. The girl who is really into him um, says that he has the correct accent, the correct look, and the, the golden standard being looking like Leonardo DiCaprio. So in this movie, Chicken Rice War, the reflexive role of the chorus in Shakespeare is split among the English-speaking newscaster in the beginning and the Malay character who sings a version of the prologue as Cantonese opera at her beverage stall. Her real message really is she keeps singing, you ask him, he does not know, you ask her, she doesn't know, that nobody knows where the feud begins. As we have seen in the film clip, uh, one, just, just like this clip, the earlier film of one husband too many uh, also contains a lot of deep connections that if you excavate, you will be astonished to discover. There are, uh, there are costumes in the Hong Kong film that are reminiscent of Danilo Donati's doublet and tights design for Franco Zeffirelli's Romeo and Juliet. And of course, they perform to the tune of Zeffirelli's A Time for Us by Nino Rota with new Cantonese lyrics. And this is but one of many examples. The idea here is not reverence or emulation, like, oh my God, the Italian Shakespeare is so great. We just have to imitate. In fact, as you know, the, the Hong Kong film, like the Singaporean one, it, it's a parody, right? It's perhaps to parody the idea of stuffy performances of Shakespeare that are out of touch with the current generation. So how about this one? Michael Amarita and Michael Amarita did a film Hamlet set uh, that, that came out in 2000. It's actually set in Manhattan. So this film appropriates Asian spirituality. Um, the movie itself is Buddhist inflected. It's of course in American English, the entire setting is, is in New York, um, it uses Shakespeare script, and yet um, it's deeply Buddhist in its ideological inflection. Here, this to be or not to be seen, you have a Vietnamese monk. This is uh, the famous Thich Nhat Han, and he's featured in a spin off, the to be or not to be speech, um, imparting wisdom, saying that to be or not to be is not a question, it's really about interbe. We interbe with trees, with, with rivers, with, with brothers, sisters, parents, meaning with other people and with nature. So there are deep connections among adaptations that extend throughout, uh, throughout different media, different genres, um, even different time periods. So the works that we have looked at so far, they are products of metacinematic and metatheatrical operations. 
Japan's Akira Kurosawa used traditional Japanese theater elements in his movie of Macbeth. His signature long shots, which remain emotionally detached, are echoed in the famous stage director uh, Ninagawa. Multilingual films such as Chicken Rice War counter the narratives about universal literary experience. All of these adaptations compel us to work with rather than work out of the space between languages. And so the deep connections among different cultures, among things that at first blush don't seem to have anything in common. It's really important because appreciating these connections can help us transcend what I call compulsory realpolitik. It's basically a tendency that some journalists in the West, when they look at non-Western cultures, um, they tend to interpret their engagement with pragmatic politics. And so uh, what you will have is South Korean productions will inevitably be, become allegories about the divide of North and South Korea. So basically reading politics into non-Western arts. Um, granted, a lot of those artworks, they do have, they, they do have the potential to be political allegories, but they, the aesthetic aspects, I think sometimes are overlooked. So that's my my what 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 I'm after here, and I hope uh, this short tour has given you a bit of uh, a bit of uh, interesting tidbits about global Shakespeare's about um, about how both Western directors like Michael Amarita and and Asian directors have engaged with Shakespeare by using some somewhat Asian motifs. So in other words, East Asian engagement Shakespeare, they do not always come out of just East Asia. Um, more and more frequently in the West, directors are beginning to appropriate um, Asian motifs as well. And I'll conclude by sharing a photo I'm quite proud of. Uh, that's our pandemic puppy when my book just came out last year. He, uh, he, he, he gave it a sniff, uh, he said it's up to sniff. So um, I, I hope you'll find it interesting as well. Here again is the promo code AAFLYG6. Uh, we'll save you 30%. In fact, I'm gonna put the Amazon link um, directly in the chat as well as the Oxford link. So I'm happy to take questions, um, you know, comments, any thoughts, um, and we can have a chat. Good. Okay. Yes, this has been wonderful, Alexa. I'm just uh, checking for questions. Well, maybe while while people are typing, I I have a question, and it goes back to Throne of Blood. And uh, I know you use it for a particular purpose there, the matter of gender dynamics through through specific language. But I wonder. I've always wondered about that film. Came out in 1957 in Japan, and 12 years after the defeat of Japan by English speaking and Shakespeare loving peoples. Uh, and I was just, I, you know, it's always been a very internationally acclaimed movie, mm -hmm. but I'm, I was just wondering in Japan, do you know, how was the reaction there? Was that in some ways considered like you're saying, speaking white to convey authority? Is that and I, I, I could just imagine the reaction of some ultranationals in Japan. Well, we don't. We, we have our own stories. We don't need to go mm -hmm. over there. Was that was that a problem? Or? Fascinating question. Thank you. Thank you, Gordon. So from the outset, let me let me let me um, um, back up a bit and say, very often Shakespeare enables artists in in other in other contexts, Afghanistan, for example, right to say things they would not otherwise be able to say, whether it's because of censorship or because they perceive um, in their local dramatic tradition. People often ask, often ask well, why, why don't you um, put on a, a, a local play, right? Something from, from your tradition. But they couldn't find the material that is um, that has such resonance, that is that, that has quote unquote convenient enough. And so Shakespeare comes in as, as some kind of vehicle, and that's what reparative uses have referred to. Now, Kurosawa, the throne of blood we spoke of, he also did the amazing King Lear, right? That's in full color, called Ran, meaning chaos. And these are actually his 
generations responses. This is post-war Japan, right? Um, and they are they are uh, struggling with the idea of kind of disillusionment in humanity. Atomic bombs were dropped. Um, whither whither the humanity? Where do we go from here? Why do humans have this seemingly built-in um, tendencies to destroy each other? And he somehow found Macbeth a powerful in Macbeth a powerful allegorical structure for him to do all this. He is of course very well known for his other samurai films, and I I would uh, I'm, I'm happy to to talk briefly about that. He actually he actually inspired. Um, inspired George Lucas in creating the Star Wars um, franchise in terms of how you tell a story. So um, Kurosawa is not exclusively dedicated to just admiring the Western classics. Um, he just happens to have found in Macbeth something that he, uh, he find compelling that he could combine with the local samurai narratives. And so in the, in the Throne of Blood, you are, it's actually a, um, it's, it's a version of Macbeth, it's a samurai version of Macbeth. And there um, he's able to innovate on film because Shakespeare represents a new element and with the new element comes innovation. So as an artist, that, that's what he's primarily concerned with. Now, Gordon, you're, you're onto something really interesting because in Japan afterwards, this is actually after Kurosawa became so famous and canonical in the West, the, the, there's some resistance within Japan, but not to criticize his selling out, but to say um, somehow, his methods, and for the conservatives, his methods are not really Japanese. So this um, can be seen in the fascinating, in the amazing fact that if you look at Kurosawa, how his name is written in Japanese, they use, um, they use katakana, which is a script reserved for trans transliteration. So it's as, as if Kurosawa is a foreigner. Um, mm. The name is written in that instead of kanji, more traditional. Um, as if they're trans transliterating that name, when of course it's Japanese. So there's, there, there, there is that, and when we repeatedly see this, I think, um, I think we are at a point in history where really national boundaries are less important than, um, than artistic heritage or what an artist want to say. And I've interviewed plenty of artists. You know, artists are, are um, you know, if you put it negatively, more ego egoistic beings, right? It's about me. I mean, stop talking about other irrelevant um, factors. Mm -hmm. Japan is cool, but can you look at me, my friend, Kurosawa, and all of this? So the interview artists, they're, they're really more interested in um, their personal inflection, the, what spin they have put on that. And they really want you to look at the, fair enough, look at the art they've created, rather than how well you represent America or Japan and whatever that might be. Okay. Okay, and uh, Sam asks, let's see, the Hong Kong film, One Husband Too Many is a sequel to The Happy Bigamist. Uh, do we need to know that movie to understand One Husband Too Many? Not at all, thank you, Sam. I'm uh, pleasantly surprised that you are a fellow fan. <laughs> Happy Bigamist, I also recommend it. And these are some of those, it's just really jolly comedies, but some people call it nonsensical, but we don't need to know Happy Bigamist to enjoy One Husband Too Many. It's, it's, it's basically a, a loser's tale um, told through his futile, a Quixotean attempt trying to, trying to revive his theater company, trying to bring, quote, civilization to Hong Kong through Romeo and Julia. Somehow he's just very a, a, attached to that. But um, it's not a sequel in the sense of, it's more like a, a, a um, they continue, the, they use the same characters, but the, in terms of events in the two films, that they're not really that connected. But, but it's really fun, check it out. Um, oh, I, I will put my, my link. So you can, you can see some highlights on my MIT Global Shakespeare um, if you're interested in this Hong Kong film. Okay. So here is oh, the... And uh, Anthony, uh, this is a big question, I think. Uh, uh, would you please speak more about how Shakespeare was carried beyond Europe, even in and near his own time? Can you say that say again? Uh, uh, how how was Shakespeare? This might be. Yeah. How was Shakespeare carried beyond Europe, even in and near his own time? If if you're able to answer that. How is Shakespeare um, carried or tra transported, transported beyond his time? Sorry. 
uh, uh, transported? How was it, it uh, conveyed? Or I, I, I imagine certainly through the British Empire at, at first uh, was, was definitely one way it was carried on. But yeah, as I understand, it mostly was in the, the opening up and certainly in East Asia, the Meiji dynasty brought it in and then later in, it was only really in the last few centuries in China, for example, that Shakespeare came in as I, as I understand it. Yeah, uh, the, the story of global Shakespeare is truly fascinating. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very, very long journey um, with very little interruption. There's interruption here and there during cultural revolution in China, for example, all foreign authors were banned, but that's approximately 10 years. And after that, Shakespeare really made a comeback. So I think it's fair to say around the world in global context, you can see the nonstop appropriation, whether it's irreverent or um, out of admiration, there can be all kinds of appropriations of Shakespeare's politicians like to quote Shakespeare as well. Um, beyond his own time, I think in, in his times, there's the famous Ben Johnson who is more jealous, right? But beyond his times, starting with the 17th century, there were already a lot of appropriations and rewritings even within England. And all of that really fed into, it's a feedback loop. It, energizes the whole Shakespeare industry. Um, so how has it been transported across all of these different time zones? Many different modes. Sometimes it's parody. Sometimes it's a fragmented quotations. It's not really full performances. Most people encounter Hamlet would know about Hamlet through lines like to be or not to be with the image of a man holding up a skull, right? So think of this kind of fragmentary, the power of fragmentary culture. We have other questions. Yes, uh, Cheryl asks, are there other examples of transgender characters in Asian films that reference Shakespeare? Um, yes, so in 2021, a Taiwanese film came out. Um, it's called As We Like It. So it's an adaptation of As You Like It. Uh, and let me put it up here as we like it, this one. And it's fascinating. Um, they have a nearly all female cast and they actually have two trans actors in there. They play really minor roles, but nonetheless, it, it's, it's symbolically important. And um, since it's all female, they do a lot of gender play. And it not, not only refer, it's actually a straightforward retelling of As You Like It. And as you know, As You Like It really is about becoming someone else. It's becoming, it's all about the elasticity of gender. So this is a really interesting, interesting film, 2021, um, but it's futuristic, set in 2030 in Taipei. Um, highly creative. It's a bit uh, psychedelic in some moments, I think. Um, I think you'll find it fascinating. Yes, and let's see, Denise has a comment, fascinating presenta presentation. You covered a lot of ground. Interesting that the fan base for the South Korean Flower Boys is very similar to that of the uh, Takura Azuka performance. Yes. Oh. Well, yes. By the way, the, the Flower Boys are also, for others, as I understand it, they're mm -hmm. very related to K-pop, the K-pop movement. That's right. Yes, K-pop. I should say flower boys are actually common kind of subculture in Korea and in Japan. You, you find in both, I mean, in Korea, yes, it's a very strong um, um, threat of K-pop. Um, okay. So um, Sam, Sam is like yeah. Branas, as you like it. Of course, it's, it's a Branas Japanese dream, right? And perhaps a bit Orientalist, um, but it does figure. My question in the book is really, when someone like, like Kenneth Branagh, Irish, um, an, an Irishman and a self-appointed spokesperson for Englishness, uh, and he's white, when it comes into appropriation elements, uh, some people, of course, um, criticize him for, for good reasons, for a kind of, uh, for, for his Orientalist take on this imaginary Japan. But then when you have, Minagawa or Kurosawa, uh, Japanese directors, when they come in and use such symbols like cherry blossom, right? 
And usually they are not criticized because they don't have the original sin. And I think it's a bit of a blind spot in critical race studies in kind of uh, looking at the identity of that artist before deciding what to criticize. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a sticky spot. So you're asking if Bronas as you like it, it makes sense. I think on a large part, it, it does. He does use Shakespeare's lines. And so you will see these semi-Japanese kind of figures, samurais speaking Shakespearean English. Um, the, the only problem is that the Japan, uh, Japanese sake in that film is deployed sometimes for ornamental values. And I think when you use that for ornamental values rather than an integral part of the storytelling, it can become quite problematic. Yeah, and, and uh, let's see, Murph has a very, okay, thank you so much for the presentation. It was such an insight into Asian representations of Shakespeare. Since I only heard of Kurosawa, it is also really impressive to see how almost all the adaptation focus on the differences between gender roles and class differences. Shakespeare was known to write uh, for literary patrons and kind of portray the opinions of their, of their times to please the monarchs. Do you think the, that adaptations are somewhat commentaries for our modern society. Absolutely. I think adaptations are a powerful tool for um, indirect political or cultural commentary. Um, it can avoid the commentary becoming didactic or being manifesto-like because on the surface, they're still telling a Hamlet-like story. Um, it's up to the audiences to connect the dots or make of it whatever they, they wish. And I think that level of flexibility really promotes self-reflexivity self because you would not just be engaging with another version of Hamlet, but actually you would be actively thinking about your own reaction to it, um, what went into this adaptation or what was left behind. And I think that kind of active thinking, um, the, 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 the metacritical part um, is really healthy for society, so for society. So that kind of modern commentary, um, I would say a, a primary function really for adaptations is commentary, uh, very often indirect. Right. Um, and very often, if you interview the artist, they, they sometimes would deny it. Where either they feign ignorance or they don't want to be too um, prescriptive and say that's the meaning of this particular work. Um, I think that's for the better. In several of those examples I gave, right, the Hong Kong one, where the Hong Kong one has one husband too many, you see the, 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 the struggle that they have. But what really is the struggle? That was 1988. That was a decade before Britain's return of Hong Kong to China. So the anxiety was already looming. So you might say it's, it's a way for the Hong Kong audiences and artists to deal with that looming anxiety. So Shakespeare represents the, the, the British West that, that they, they are more culturally affiliated with, right? Mm -hmm. but, but what exactly is there? They're, they're the in between, they're in between the mainland Chinese um, influence that's looming, looming large about to devour them and, and, and the British were about to leave. So the film can be seen as a way to kind of, for them to figure this out, to, to make sense of it. So that right there is powerful commentary. If, if I could one, uh, and speaking of adaptation, and if I, I wanna just tie something back to a lecture we had last year, uh, we had a Dr. Uh, Letty Garcia from UC Santa Barbara who came and spoke on Shakespeare in Mexico. And we got into this question of adaptation. It can be, and she brought this concept of being culturally competent. And in other words, you can't just, okay, well, let's do uh, Two Gentlemen of Verona and we'll set it in Mexico and we'll call it Two Gentlemen of Veracruz and they'll all wear sombreros and crab will be played by a chihuahua. Okay, and, that, and that's a wrap. Okay, and, and but you know, that's, and they've been, you know, she explained there have been attempts like that and they think that's enough. Um, but uh, it, it certainly is a fraught area or something you don't want to enter into lightly. And especially reading, when you talk about compulsory realpolitik and, and the problem of, okay, a, 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 a native does a production, uh, does a play, adapts it, but a Westerner said, oh, well, that must mean you're talking about this. But it must be, I, I can, in, from my experience in Korea, 
I, I can imagine a, a Korean playwright or director adapting King Lear mostly for the division of the state. That's one thing. Uh, but also, too, in, in modern Korean history, there's this, there was this figure, um, Lee Sung Man, who was the first president of the Republic of, of South Korea, also in English known as Syngman Rhee. But he had been a great hero. He'd been before the, during the Japanese occupation. But once he became president, he became corrupt and sort of incompetent and authoritarian. And he eventually had to be pushed out. Now, he didn't lose his mind like Lear. But I can see a a a, a you know a, a, a playwright know. doing that, and it wouldn't. I don't think that would be a glib. That wouldn't be a superficial adaptation, correct? There, there certainly yes, ways to do it. yes, yes. To say this one is like this. Um, there's a Thai film um, out of Thailand, the Macbeth must die, and it's about military dictatorship. It direct references to um to Thai dictators. It was actually banned there to add to the spiciness of the story. But you're right, it's when, when arti artists come in and do it in terms of commentary, if it's too on the nose, perhaps it's, it's, it's more superficial and less interesting historically 20 years down the road, right? Mm -hmm. Kurosawa is making commentary about the post-war disillusion in humanity, but not quite in an on the nose way. And so even now, nearly half a century later, we're still enjoying Kurosawa as a classic. So I think this different, it's a question of level, mm -hmm. but such a great point. Okay, and Sam has a question. Yeah, Sam, translation is always problematic. Ancient Greek plays can be destroyed with bad translations. Uh, are there movies you recommend we avoid or watch carefully because of bad translations? Oh, good question. Thank you so much, Sam. Um, I, I don't have a list of uh, movies to be banned or avoided, but I do have titles that I would recommend that we rewatch um, with better. So my analysis of Kurosawa in the beginning, right? All of that, the, the, the gender play, the subtlety with the gender pronouns, all that is lost because the English translation just put I. They don't give you any like, oh, which, which, which I we have. So if we can rewatch that with a more um, fine-tuned, with a set of more fine-tuned subtitles, we're going to get so much more out of it because very often we just, uh, it flies by us. And, and you know, subtitles can be heuristic. It can also be, be like a sensor because it smooths things over. So that's something we think about, but there are no bad translations because these are essentially not translations. Kurosawa rewrote it. it it's a rewritten story. It's not like line by line translated of Shakespeare. Um, so that's quite a different situation. Uh, the Hong Kong film, the Singapore film, they may occasionally have, recognizable Shakespeare lines, but it's not about trans, like performing a translated script. Um, and so in that sense, there are no bad translations, but there are movies you can rewatch and discover new things just because you're now paying attention to something else as opposed to um, how do they tell this familiar story. Yeah, in Denise comments English is lacking in these pronoun subtleties. Definitely. Yeah, uh, European languages, Spanish, for example, as well, right? Those gender languages. I think it'll be really fun to 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 watch a Shakespeare comedy, one of those comedies with cross dressing, in one of these languages that mm -hmm. that has space for gender play. Okay, we're going, going once, um, going twice. Well, Alexa, this was fabulous. This is absolutely, absolutely fabulous. And thank you so much. Uh, and everyone, please remember uh, Alexa's book, Shakespeare in East Asia. Uh, and you know, you, you've got the information. Uh, and I do, oh, is there one more? Okay. Um, I do want to just close though by saying, um, uh, just mention our, our lecture series will continue. Uh, we have a hybrid presentation on March 20th at the Coronado Public Library on engaging your kids with Shakespeare by Brendan Kelso, who was a prior speaker. And this is on the critical need to impart Shakespeare to later generations. Uh, and tentatively, sometime in May or June, to be determined, we plan, now hold on to your hats, to hold an open forum on the authorship question. 
Uh, and believe me, that topic always brings out the brass knuckles and the nunchucks. So you got the sharks and the jets. Uh, come if you dare. But anyway, thank you, everyone, for attending. Uh, and by the way, this is, and tell your friends, this if you remember, uh, this, this is recorded and you can watch it later. So um, anyway, have, have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you all. Thank you, Gordon. And uh, bless you, San Diego Shakespeare Society. Thank you so much.